Welcome. We're here at a Safe Church webinar that I'm so excited about. It's something I've wanted to do a long time. Um, it's elevate the voices of those who have experienced abuse so we can all understand what more about what it's about and what it's like to experience abuse. So I'm just so thankful for our panel today and I'm so thankful that you're here joining us. Let me open with a prayer to get started. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have created your body with all different kinds of people and that you know each one intimately and that each one is precious in your sight, Lord. And so Lord, our heart breaks when that image of you gets destroyed by abuse. And we know that your heart breaks too. And Lord, I pray that you would use this time and this webinar to help us understand what that experience is like for those who have experienced it, and that you would um, help us be able to walk alongside with your love and with your grace as we learn and listen. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you would bless this time together. Amen. All right. So, um, First, I want to introduce myself. I'm um, Bonnie Nicholas, former director of Safe Church Ministry in the CRC. And we have two other staff members here with Hi. us today. Hi, I'm Becky, uh, Becky Jones, and I'm the Safe Church Volunteer and Communication Specialist, and I work out of the Burlington office in Ontario. Hi, I'm Eric Koss, and I'm an associate with Safe Church Ministry, and I've been working with Safe Church for about three and a half years. And for those of you who don't know what Safe Church Ministry is, we are an agency of the Christian Reformed Church, and it's our role to equip congregations in abuse awareness, prevention, and response. And we're so glad to have uh, a few people who've been invested in Safe Church for quite some time with us today as well. All right. Um, and we have two very courageous people who have joined us to talk about their experience today. Um, Lori, do you want to start and just tell us a little bit about who you are? Hi, I'm Lori Leap, and I live in Beaverton, Oregon. Um, my husband pastors Christian Reformed Church here. We've been here for 30 some years. Thank you so much for coming. And we also have um, Kelly. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kelly Sibthorpe. I live in uh, Port Dover, Ontario, and it's been my privilege to be associated uh, from time to time with Safe Church in different ministry ministries. Um, I'm a retired campus minister, formerly at uh, Fanshawe College uh, as campus minister in London, Ontario, and I've been a pastor for the past 25 years. All right, thank you so much. Um, my first question is going to be for Lori. And as prevalent as abuse is, affecting one in four girls, one in six boys, it's still not easy to talk about. And especially in the context of our churches, where we like to hide um, our struggles. So um, I think that these are the voices that we really have to hear, those who have experienced it, so that we can understand it better. Now, when I first talked to you, Lori, about being a part of this webinar, um, what made you say yes when I asked you to participate? Yes, um, it's been a long time since I started my journey, um, but um, I found that whenever I speak about the abuse that happened to me, there is a feeling of weight taken off me from uh, the load of shame and uh, guilt that um, had pressed down upon me in those earlier years. And also I found that whenever I shared, it encouraged and almost gave permission for others to open up their Pandora's box, as I always looked at my abuse, my Pandora's box. So it was easy for me to um, say yes. I won't say that I'm not nervous about this, but um, I know that it's a good thing for me to do always. 
Thank you so much, Laurie. Um, my next question is um, for Kelly. And this is a really unfair question um, because I know that abuse is such a devastating and such a horrible experience that you can't really talk about it briefly. You can say what happened. For example, I was raped, but that doesn't get at the real experience of it. But I'm gonna ask the question anyway. <laughs> So um, I'm wondering if you can perhaps give us just a brief timeline of when you experienced your abuse and kind of what your journey has been since then. Thanks for asking. Um, it's a very good question. Over the years I've, through counseling and um, other ways of looking at life, um, I've been able to, through God's help, look at life um, from a positive perspective, and I've been able to take a balcony view of the abuse situation that happened to me when I was 13 years old. I've been able to um, separate that those incidents from um, by imagining that the person that did that to me um, uh, were had been drawn down in a cycle of of violence within a cycle of uh, of a power struggle within and when they met me and abused me it was simply a manifestation of something that happened to them i happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and uh, i i think i fit the profile of what that person might have been looking for um, and so i've been able to separate myself from my abuser and uh, Consequently, I'm able to live my life in a more healthy way, understanding that person was fallen. They're a victim of the fall from grace. Uh, they, they commuted that sin upon me, their sin upon me. Um, and consequently, I've been able to forgive and let go in, in, uh, in a meaningful way so that I can live my life uh, for Christ the way that he intended me to. Uh, those incidents happened when I was 13 years old um, in a school setting. Uh, due to the shame of that, uh, feeling minimalized, when someone is abused, uh, the effect is to minimize that person. And I think that's why certain victims are chosen by abusers is to minimize that person and magnify their own personality. In other words, to make them feel more powerful, that they have power and domination over an individual. It's not about sex, it's about power. And so when I was abused, I remember feeling a tremendous amount of shame. Uh, I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. In fact, the first person I told uh, was uh, about 12 years ago. Um, I'm 62 now, that happened when I was 13. Um, God in his grace has brought a lot of healing and uh, wonderful things to my life. Um, redemption from that. Uh, but I could never forget that incident. It, it, it was jarring and it was um, so hurtful and so minimizing, uh, so shameful uh, that I could not talk about it. Um, in fact, if you do talk about it, you wonder what the consequences of your revelations will be whether you'll be judged or laughed at or, but I realized as a, as a, a more powerful, stronger adult that I could talk about it. I acquired the proper language and tools to, um, to reveal what happened. Thank you so much. Um, like I said, it's a courage, it takes a lot of courage to come forward because you don't know what the response will be always. So Lori, I'm gonna ask you the same unfair question. If you can briefly um, share with us just a little bit about your journey and what that's been like for you. For me, uh, my first abuse happened when I was seven years old, at least according to my memories. And um, it was a, um, a random kind of a thing of a, uh, the son of a ranch hand that worked on our ferry. And, um, but we moved <clears throat> quite soon after that. And to me, it had been a game. 
as a seven-year-old, not knowing what I was getting into. Uh, but the lessons that I learned from that, the shame that started happening after um, not telling the guilt, um, not understanding the confusion uh, started multiplying. And then when I was in sixth grade, I had a teacher who was an abuser, teacher within the Christian school that many of us have gone to, uh, same CSI school. And um, the lessons that I had learned as a seven-year-old uh, were cemented in definitely at that point. Um, being a victim, being feeling powerless <clears throat> in the classroom uh, because it was such a power play that this teacher uh, did upon all of us students. And, um, and yet he was, interestingly enough, but not surprising, he was the most fun teacher that we had which made it all the more confusing in talking with a classmate uh, from that time, just a year or two ago, he said, yeah, that was my favorite teacher. And I said, yeah, he was that, but he was also an abuser. And um, so the confusion of that just adds to all of the mixed up feelings that you have. Um, I did not tell anyone until I was, um, married 15 years when I told my husband and um, at that point it was just a fact of something that happened in my life but I didn't think or understand what it had done to me um, and when we moved to the church where we are now um, in 1987 a year later, we went to Reform Encounter weekend and where you're asked to share all your feelings together. It was just nearly impossible for me to, to um, touch base with them. I just could not connect with the feelings. And we wondered, I want, uh, is this having anything to do with the abuse that happened to me? And so we decided we'd pursue perhaps looking for a counselor. And that night I had the first dream I ever had about my abuser being after me. And the next morning on television was the, um, on one of the, familiar talk shows was the introduction of the book Courage to Heal. And it was like God was hitting me over the head with a two by four saying, Lori, now is the time. This is the place, this is the time for you to, um, to work on this. Having been here only a year, it was, it was good. Um, we knew the people well enough. And since then I was on this uh, counseling for about four years and um, it was just a tremendous time of hardship, of challenge, but yet increasing hope and understanding and to the point of um, seeing who I was, as Kelly said, as God intended me to be, not the one who was, a, a, um, my, my counselor, Byron, explained it this way, we're like a tapestry. And when abuse happens, all of the threads get tangled in a mess so that it doesn't really portray a true picture and when you go through the counseling, you pull out each one of those strands and you examine them. Are they something you wanna keep or are they something you want to discard? And then you reweave the ones you believe to be healthy back in your life picture. 
And what ends up happening is a picture of health um, far better than where you were when you started. That's a, that's a beautiful image and picture. And um, thank you both for sharing, and taking us a little bit into the depth that's so hard to understand. People don't understand how deep this can go. So thank you for sharing that. Um, this question is for Kelly. Churches can often be places um, where even well-intentioned people can cause harm by their actions sometimes. So how has the church influenced your healing journey? How has it maybe been helpful to you? And maybe how has it been unhelpful to you? Thank you. Um, thanks, Lori. I, I like that illustration of the tapestry and um, putting back the proper threads. The church um, really helped me I, I took a close look at uh, what community should be. I remember in my early 20s uh, studying community and what community is supposed to be. Um, a caring group of people that puts the needs of others, each individual always looks to the needs of others, um, putting aside selfish desires, putting aside um, harmful practices, uh, reining in the self that would be destructive to others and asking God to change and rework your heart. And so that's how community should be, a, a group of caring individuals uh, of all different ages who have the, the, highest, um, uh, the highest values and achievements possible for the community on their mind, each one contributing their own gifts, talents, and abilities to make that community successful. However, from time to time in any community, and I'm speaking whether it's a hockey team, a soccer team, uh, the Boy Scout troop or the Girl Guides or a church, in any community, there can be wolves in sheep's clothing. People that have not conformed to what the standards of the community require for behavior. And often that behavior is secret and hidden and destructive. Um, so in the church, this exists. We would rather, we would rather believe that in the community of grace, that abusive people, people with uh, intentions that are below the norms, that are destructive, don't exist. They can't be in the church. And when we discover that, whether it's a deacon, an elder, a pastor or any kind of person that has moral authority within the body of Christ, when we discover that they are less than stellar in their behavior, um, shame happens. We, we, we sense shame when it happens to us. If, if I'm a victim of abuse, the first thing that happens is disbelief, is this can't be happening. How can this person that I've looked up to for years now do this to me? So there's denial, denial takes place. And then often abusers or bullies, they're another bullying behavior is part of it, will make threats and say, you can't tell me, you know, you can't share this with anybody. And of course that person being older with more authority, what are you gonna do as a powerless victim? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna say? You're not going to try and tell another person in authority what happened to you because you'll just be shut down. You'll be told to be quiet or Shh, you can't say anything about that. So there's an increasing powerlessness, powerlessness in the church. Um, churches, most congregations have silent victims sitting in the pews that are afraid to speak out because that would influence and destroy the power structure. If they were believed, if incidents were believed to be true surrounding their stories, then that threatens the power structure. And if we threaten power structures, then the community is in danger of collapse. And so the last thing we want is our community to collapse around us and to be in scandal, to be in trouble. 
And so the powerless are made even more powerless by being told to be quiet uh, through shame, through threat. Um, it's hard to believe this happens in the church, but it's 2020, uh, it's soon to be 2021. We're in a more enlightened time. And when you do your, your homework and um, several universities have done uh, very, very good research on what happens in all church communities, in all communities. Um, and their research is astounding, it's eye-opening, it's breathtaking um, to know that within our own churches, the CRC included, um, we've ignored this problem, we've, we've hoped that it would go away by just moving someone around to a different call or a different place, or maybe um, instigating some slap on the wrist. Um, but we're in a different day. I think um, it's time for the church to be more helpful to its survivors, to recognize who they are, to empower them, to listen to their stories, to, uh, to take time to understand the deep, deep shame and grief and destruction that has gone on in their lives. Um, since becoming a pastor, um, I've dealt with so many victims of abuse, especially um, in campus ministry. Student after student would come to my office and tell me another heartbreaking story of abuse in the church. Uh, some were suicidal. Um, they had to be taken to hospital. Uh, others became uh, and still are substance abusers. Um, many left the church never to come back. And the biggest, the largest um, tragedy in this is many abuse victims lose their faith. How could God allow this? in my life. And so they lose their, they lose hope in God. Uh, that's a tragedy. I remember uh, reading in the gospels that uh, if we cause one of these little ones to stumble and to lose their faith, uh, it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the depths of the sea. But that's what some of our, some of our leaders are doing. They're um, tying millstones around their own necks in perpetrating abuse, um, causing little ones to stumble and fall and to lose their faith. Um, it's a tragedy. Um, and it's all based on the need to have more power or to feel powerful. It's not about sexuality. It's, sex just happens to be the, the tool or the lever that is used to, to feel powerful. Um, I like Andre Crouch's book about power, where he talks about the right use of power. When church leaders are given power, that power is to be used appropriately um, with uh, the right ends in, in mind, uh, use, using that power to uh, help the community flourish, not to destroy it. I've seen several communities destroyed by abusive pastors. And um, so hopefully these conversations we're having today will bring more awareness that uh, this subject needs to be studied in depth. There's been a lot of research done on it and it's my prayer that more and more pastors and church leaders, deacons, elders would, uh, uh, would find the resources out there, would commit to learning the resources and using them like Safe Church. Safe Church is a wonderful resource. Um, Get your hands on the material. Institute a safe church team in your church. It's so, so important. And I'll pause there. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, I really, really appreciate those words. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, we're going to keep moving on here. It's, it's hard to keep moving on. This is, this is deep, um, deep, heavy stuff. So again, thank you for sharing with us, helping us understand. So um, this question is for Lori. And um, so a lot of people in church have said, or a lot of survivors have said that church is the hardest place for them to be. 
And um, I'm just wondering about your experience. Um, what happened when you told, did you tell someone at church about your experience? And what was that like for you? Or if you didn't tell someone at church about your experience, what held you back and what kept you silent? My experience was probably just a little bit different than maybe others in that um, I'm a pastor's wife. And so for me, when this became clear that um, I needed to go on this journey, I knew it was going to affect not just myself, but my husband. I didn't realize how, what, to what extent, but I knew that it was going to be an effect. And also I knew that I was going to need a lot of prayer support. Um, so Carl and I talked about it and decided we would ask three couples to be <clears throat> our prayer warriors um, initially. Um, they were leaders within the church, uh, very well respected and um, also just strong prayer warriors um, who would give us the encouragement and support we knew we would probably need. As time went along um, and I found out the beautiful um, impact of sharing, of letting go of that secret, um, I began to tell more people whom I trusted. And they, in turn, just were tremendous supports for both Carl and I, because Carl went on his own journey, too. It wasn't just me. It was my husband who also went on a journey um, because I was, um, I was not who I had been previously. I changed, um, which is a good thing, but, um, and he didn't always know how to respond to that. And so for him, um, he talked with others and got support from them as the Years went along, uh, we shared with more and more as our trust level with people um, grew and to expand it to the point where um, by the end of my therapy years, uh, most everybody knew um, in varying degrees of where we were. Um, we found that also in the sharing, um, the support also became uh, people sharing their own stories. It gave them permission to open up, to look and examine their own experiences. And um, by the end of the four years, there was a group of us uh, survivors who uh, created a support group for each other. Um, the one thing that uh, was very important in sharing our story uh, to others is, and for people to understand is that it's, people need to believe what you're saying is true, that um, these did, not only happened to you, but the impact of, of what happened to you is so profound. It, it is so encompassing of every facet of your being, uh, how it has affected you, that um, it, it's an incredible journey to try and come back and be rid of, I think of them as uh, filters in a way that as you have experienced abuse, there are filters that come in front of you that warp your perspective and understanding of life. And you get quite a few of these filters, uh, uh, whether it's your faith filter, 
whether it's your need for control, um, you're looking at life in black and white, um, just one after another, they affect how you interact with people, how you perceive life in general. And so, um, yeah, it's getting back to the question. Uh, people need to understand that this is such a profound change in your life. And to be able to support you in that is just as important um, as believing the story, believing the story of what happened to you. It's beyond that. It's where you are in, in your perceptions and where you need to be going. Um, prayer support, always. I felt um, great need because it seemed like there were times when evil was very, very real and close. Um, and I needed that protection also. Thank you for sharing that, Lori. I know um, I, so many of us are isolated also during these times and uh, appreciate the stories of support that you've experienced. Um, and Kelly, uh, a question for you is, a lot of times church leaders have a challenging time talking about the topic of abuse. I'm wondering, what are some, uh, some things that you wish every church leader knew about abuse? Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that question. Um, most church leaders are, are very busy people, and um, that's why they're in leadership. They know how to work hard. Um, they've been chosen and selected for skill levels, gift sets. Um, uh, many that I have talked to leaders, they will give the subject of abuse within the church kind of a, a passing glance um, and move on. Uh, they, many of them are aware, most church leaders are aware that um, abuse does happen in churches, but they've never been personally affected by it or they've never been perpetrators. They know it's out there. Um, oftentimes it's uh, swept under the rug that, well, if it happens under my watch, then I'll deal with it. You know, but we have so many other things to do. We have uh, the work of the church to do. So it becomes kind of a passing thought um, unless they're directly impacted by it. And sometimes that becomes a sudden shock where uh, a situation happens and safe church needs to be contacted. What I would suggest for leaders is um, to allocate uh, a portion of their time budget to education, um, utilize the resources of safe, of safe church. Uh, do commit 2% of your time to educating yourself on the, the reality that is abuse in our communities, um, whether it's emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, uh, or sexual abuse. Um, it, there is the reality of abuse in our communities, and it does need to be addressed and dealt with. That is why we have ministries like Safe Church and Bonnie, who has done such a great job the last 10 years, and yourself, Eric, and Becky, who are trying to bring awareness, trying to make leaders aware of the reality of abuse in our congregations. Um, the unfortunate and sad thing is that oftentimes that is not paid attention to until something happens, then it's too late. Uh, the time to start a safe church committee is today. The time to have uh, hall monitors and windows put in your office doors or whatever it is, is now. The time to have police checks done on your leadership is now. The time to put abuse policies into effect for local congregations is now. Get it done now. Prevent. Prevention um, is a huge aspect of saving lives, uh, of saving people from the destruction 
that abuse causes. So I would encourage all leaders out there to um, arm yourselves, educate yourselves, uh, and put those committees and practices in, into place that will save a lot of vulnerable, vulnerable people down the line, including children, young people, and adults. Adults are, off, are also victims of abuse, and that's a reality that we need to address as well. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kelly. I really appreciate that. Um, Lori, the next question is for you. So I just want you to imagine the ideal church, or if not a church, a community, somewhere you, where you would feel safe and loved and where you would belong. And I'm just hoping that you can really give us some um, characteristics, actions, attitudes that we would find in this type of community. Um, and just let us know what that would look like and just what makes a safe space for you, what your ideal for a safe space would be and for others who have experienced abuse. For me, having a safe space, uh, a church, is a place where burdens such as this are shared um, and honored and um, know that your confidentiality is always, always top priority that you will be prayed for, that the pastor, whoever that might be, whether it's your husband or if it's, it's someone else, is going to take this as a serious situation and problem within the church and take appropriate um, measures to make sure he and the rest of the leadership that it will not happen in the church. As Kelly explained, uh, just putting all of those safeguards in place, um, doing what we can to make sure that there is never an opportunity for a younger person or a person of the opposite sex or the same sex, whatever, to be abused. Um, that power is not something that is sought, but power like is a privilege and it is something that comes with great responsibility and that responsibility is servanthood. With power comes servanthood. The two should just be hand in hand uh, no matter what authority you have within a church, um, that the, the resultant attitude of a person is humility and servanthood so that you look at, at um, your being part of Christ's kingdom is one of humility and serving other people in whichever way you can without harm in any way. Um, that to me is, is the ideal church. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Or did you have more to share? No, just thinking. Um, <laughs> I've worked in the last couple of years with a neighboring classes on that whole thing of power. Um, and the more I get into it, the more I just see uh, so much the need for this to be discussed deeply within um, the Christian Reformed Church. It just has to be because power has had such a different characterization um, within leadership and uh, abuse, taking that power, abusing it, it demeans, it diminishes, 
and it dismisses people mm -hmm. and it ultimately can destroy people. And no matter what form that abuse of power takes, that, that is what happens. Um, and so having discussions, more open discussions, I think within our church of how do we use the power that we are given or granted, um, I think can go a very long way also. Thank you. Yeah. And you, your quote, you know, on with great power comes great responsibility. It's not only a, a great quote from Spider-Man, but it's, it is, it's an, it's a necessary quote that, that all of us who have positions of power need to take carefully and think about how we are affecting one another and to own up to harms that may have been caused and to create right relationships. And how are we able to do that in the church? Um, and so to, to dive into what that power looks like, I think is so key. As, as, an abu or as a survivor, each one of us in our own lives have to examine where, because we've been abused, where might I be also abusing someone else? Because abuse of power begets abuse of power. That's just the way it is because you've lost the power. You seek to find it back by overpowering someone else. And I know for myself, that has been a big consideration. How have I unknowingly overwhelmed, manipulated, or whatever form that takes? How have I done that and help me Lord to just open my eyes the minute I see it happening. Yeah. And putting that into context and understanding um, when we, we don't need to feel shame to speak up and knowing that our voice is valued and necessary and also having key support people like you mentioned, um, Lori, who can, who can, we can speak to honestly and share um, things that we may not uh, be able to share with other people and to have those relationships of trust. Um, these are the, we're down to the final few questions. And so is there anything that you wish we would have asked or anything that you would like to tell us before we end this webinar? Uh, okay. Nick, oh. Kelly first and then Lori. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was thinking a lot about this and I'm, I'm a bit of a dreamer. I've always been a dreamer in ministry and, you know, always trying to imagine things to be better than they can be. And how do we, how do we get them to be better? How do we uh, work in the kingdom to get things to, to a better place? Hmm. And I, I'm trying to imagine a better world for survivors. Like what would a better world for survivors look like? Um, I think that's part of, of what we're trying to do here is to reimagine space in a way or create space, um, volumize a space for survivors, uh, victims of abuse where they can go and feel safe, someplace that's safe because so many of them feel unsafe. Um, as Lori, you shared how hard it was to tell your story, how hard it is to to relate our experiences. And I didn't tell my story until I felt safe to do so. So maybe we can try and imagine this space that uh, contains this ultimate safety where no more harm will come to a victim or a survivor of abuse, that they'll be protected, that um, they will know that God has their back, that people have their back, that they will not receive any more harm. In fact, that they could be change agents uh, for others if they come out and tell their story. Whether that's in social media, maybe it's a Facebook page that we create for survivors of CRC abuse of power, and they can have their own Facebook group. Something happened uh, in social media with the uh, the Me Too movement when they're 
when they had sufficient numbers, there was this catalytic event, uh, effect. This, uh, the numbers became a catalyst where they felt safe enough because of their numbers to come out and to begin to confront power, the power that had abused them. So I'm wondering if in our church, we can create a safe enough space where survivors can come together and be able to tell their stories in safety and then take it from there and see where it goes. Maybe they can transform our communities uh, because of that. That's what I'd like to imagine anyway. Thank you. Yeah, we may have a new dream and uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how that may be made a reality. Um, Lori, do you have anything else to share? One thing that um, I think is very important for survivors of any kind of abuse, and you might not look at what your experience, you might not look at it as I was abused. Um, I was not raped. I was not, um, what, um, what, it, just because it's a, a lesser, and it, I use that very carefully, just because it wasn't the extreme abuse does not mean that it wasn't abuse. And it has affected each one of us. And I just want each person to know that it is so important to go get help. Go talk to someone who has experience in working with this. Um, because um, as I said earlier, this affects us in ways that we are not whatsoever aware of. And um, I would encourage even more to go to a Christian counselor because our faith is so very wrapped up in this. And um, I know I found for myself as compared with some other people who I knew very well that sought help from non-Christian counselors, and they sort of took a different journey. And while I can't say it was a, a, a better or healthier journey, I saw a lot of differences. And so I encourage you find a Christian counselor, go talk to them and um, find your way to health the way God intended you to be. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for this. Um, I think both of you have just given us um, just so much to think about, um, so much to ponder. I just think I'm going to be just thinking about it for some time to come, all the aspects that you've um, presented and shared and just been so vulnerable in coming to this space to give us. Um, I think what I'm just hoping you can do, each of you, I'm going to um, start with Kelly and then move to Lori, is just uh, one key takeaway that you would like each of us to pull from your story or from your experience. So I'm going to start with you, Kelly. I guess I would uh, like to say too, as Lori said, um, number one, um, if you're a survivor, a uh, victim, help, there is help out there. Help is available. Uh, again, Safe Church has all the resources that you need. So reach out. It may be reaching out beyond your own community, but reaching out beyond your own community is a good thing. Um, there are people out there that understand what has happened to you. Um, when you reach out to get help, that's when uh, the burden begins to lift. When you're strong enough and you feel courageous enough, uh, that, and that brings me to the other point is courage. Um, it's hard to muster courage when you feel minimalized and marginalized and powerless, uh, but reach down deep. There's still within you, if you're a survivor, there's courage down there. Reach down, pull it up and reach out. Reach out to, to Safe Church, to Eric, to Becky. Uh, they will um, bring to bear all the resources that you need 
to get help. Um, and then tell your story. Find the right people to tell your story to. Talk to your pastor. Challenge your pastor and your church leadership to uh, make Safe Church a bigger part of your community's uh, programming. Uh, Safe Church is such an important part of community programming. And um, so begin to talk, begin to reach out, muster the courage, pray, God will help you. Um, I know I pray for, for victims and survivors every day, the silent ones. I pray that they will begin to, to look outside themselves for help. Um, and as soon as you make that first step, you will get help. All the resources are there to help you. Um, they're looking at you now on this screen, or maybe you're not seeing their faces, but uh, Eric, Becky, your safe church team in your, in your church, don't be afraid to reach out and talk. Begin the conversation. As soon as you do that, as Lori said earlier, you'll begin to feel lighter. Uh, the burden will begin to lift. Um, and then it just gets, and then God will bring healing. Um, people will be, the right people will begin to lead you along and help you. And it's my prayer that you recover and uh, become all that you can be in Jesus Christ. Um, God never meant you to be so burdened down and, and crushed under by the weight of abuse. He wants you to rise up and, and be resurrected in a way and become who you're meant to be in Christ. And that is a beautiful creation. Uh, someone that's gifted and talented and ready to help their community. Thank you so much, Kelly. Lori, I'm going to turn it to you now. You know, I think Kelly did such a beautiful job. I don't need to add to it. He said every single thing that I was thinking of and more. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, our time is about ended here. And I just want to thank you both so much for sharing your stories with us and for the hope that you have um, shared also in sharing your stories. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I also just want to, it's this is hard, I'm recording this now while I'm still director and then by the time this is actually, while you're listening, I will be moved on to other things, but this has always been a passion of my heart that the voices of people who have survived abuse will be lifted up and that the church would listen to those voices because those are gonna be the leaders that will take us forward to a better place, to those faithful communities that we've been talking about that are safe for people to share where healing and God's transforming love can really be revealed and work. So um, yeah, so that's that's my vision. That's, and I'm sure that Eric and Becky will carry that vision on and whoever the new director is by the time this airs. So again, thank you for your time. Um, Eric, I think you're gonna close us out now. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And I'm, I'm cognizant that the spirit has been with us in this conversation the whole time. And in many ways, um, the Lord has uh, continued to hear us, but we uh, want to speak to the Lord directly now as well. So triune God, we thank you for the way that you are present in this conversation. We thank you for, for Kelly. We thank you for Lori. We thank you for Bonnie and Becky and uh, that we're able to be here together and um, specifically for Kelly and Lori as they have shared their story and shared um, so many uh, so many pieces of, of your wisdom. Um, we pray that we're able to take this and hold on to it as the church. And we pray that your church, Lord, is continued to be bound up and that you elevate the voices of those who, who um have often not uh, been hurt. And so we pray for those who've been victimized by all kinds of abuse, whether it's sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, spiritual abuse. Lord, you know all the things that have gone on and you continue to walk alongside of us. Um, continue to give us 
your power. Uh, for those of us who are given power in all aspects of our lives, we know that you give us all the power, whether it's the power of a, a little child or a baby screaming and, um, or the power of a pastor. Uh, we pray that uh, for those who have significant power that they steward it well and they allow voices to be heard and they allow for you to bring your kingdom continually every day. And we ultimately pray for your gospel to be known um, for this world and that you continue to make all things new. And we thank you that survivors are often the ones who are leading us. And so we thank you for the voices that were represented here today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks again.